Okay, so this is the Turning Pro workshop. It's the final workshop in a series of free workshops that I have been running over the last two weeks um, as part of my Female Business Academy launch. That's open for enrollment at the moment. I'm going to talk about it super briefly at the end of the workshop, but um, I'm not going to, it's not a part of the workshop. The workshop's on the topic of turning pro and it's based on this book, if you can see it, um, by Stephen Pressfield. So turning pro, tap your inner power and create your life's work. I've done a ton of stuff with this and with my um, academy members. I've done uh, Facebook Lives on it. I did a free challenge in it. It's a book that completely changed my life um, and my business life in terms of uh, how I began showing up in my business and so um, it's super important. What I've done is I've taken the, the book and the kind of premise behind the book and I've created a structure for how um, you can make the transition from amateur to pro. He's quite ruthless in the book about um, describing us as amateurs if, we're, if we haven't adopted the, the pro mindset. So bear with me as I, as I use some of that language and don't, hopefully um, you don't take it personally if, <laughs> if I'm implying that you're an amateur in any way. I think in, 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 in the main, we're all amateurs. We're all on this journey and learning. So it's, it's, a, it's an ongoing journey. Um, and I'm going to, that's what the workshop's going to be, be about. That's what we're going to talk about today. So I'll start by sharing a little bit about me. I'm your host. Um, so I'm a business and mindset coach, and I'm the founder of the Female Business Academy. And um, as, as a coach and, and founder of the Academy, what I do is provide female entrepreneurs with the tools and strategies to build and grow a meaningful business without selling their soul. Um, and that without selling their soul piece is really important to me. So um, there's a lot of advice out there in the world, business advice um, and how to create online businesses that don't take into account um, that that part of it, that, that soulful aspect of it. So one of the things that I try to do with my work is really combine the strategic and the soulful um, and have people um, feel good about the work that they do and not feel like they have to employ sleazy and icky sales tactics and all of that stuff in order to create a successful business. And I try and model that in everything that I do. As well as my business persona, I'm also um, a very proud mama and life partner to these two angels. So on the left is Joanne, my life partner. I call him my life partner just because we're not married. We will be one day, but we're not yet. And uh, my little boy, Oscar, who's nearly, not quite, but nearly eight months old and is the light of my life. So um, Joanne's also a coach and, and also has his own online academy, but he's Spanish, so he does all of his work in Spanish and I do all of mine in English. Very similar work, but different countries and different audiences. So um, to give you a little bit of background in terms of my why, like why I do this work and why it's important to me and, and why I'm sharing this stuff with you today. Basically, I did the, um, the usual uh, conventional tried and tested path to success. I kind of, I, you know, I applied myself in school. I went to college. I went to university. I got a degree. I got myself on the corporate ladder. I kind of spent many years, well over a decade, um, working my way up that ladder and getting promotion after promotion. And when I reached around the age of 35 in 2012, I realized that I, um, well, later, earlier than that, actually, I realized that I was, I just was not um, happy at all. And I, I was feeling very unfulfilled. I'd chosen to work in the charity sector because I wanted to have an impact on the world, a positive impact, and I wanted to help people. But um, I got to this point where I realized that was not what was going on. And so I made quite a drastic decision to um, quit my well-paid job in the middle of a recession, which um, horrified my, my family and some of my friends. And I um, sold everything that I owned and bought a one-way ticket to Thailand. And the plan was to go and travel the world whilst building a business as a coach. And I, I, I did the coach part, I built the business. Um, I didn't quite travel the entire world because I got stuck in um, Asia and I fell in love with Thailand and lived there for several years, which is where I met Joanne. Um, and I, I started out as, as a life coach working with both men and women um, 
on that journey while I was while I was away traveling and um, something that that became I became acutely aware of was the way in which women in particular seem to be holding themselves back from truly sharing their gifts with the world and I know it's a sweeping generalization to say that there are certain um, ways that women um, are showing up in business that, that men aren't there are certainly uh, women who don't hold themselves back and there, and there are certainly men that do but I was just seeing certain patterns like perfectionism um, a real fear of uh, taking risks and putting themselves out there and I just decided that for me um, working with women on the topic of entrepreneurship was was the best way I could have the biggest impact on the world um, because if I was achieving you know if I if I was empowering female change makers to shine and to rise in the world then that would increase the impact that I could have in the world and so that's what I decided to do actually only um, this year uh, while I was on maternity leave so my baby was born in March and I went back to work on the 1st of May and I decided to launch a whole new business um, which which was working specifically with women and and that's when I decided to also launch the female business academy so uh, that's just a little bit about my why then who is this for and when I say this I mean this workshop the work that I do uh, the academy everything that I kind of offer in the world um, Soulful female entrepreneurs is kind of like the top level description that I would use. I do use uh, different um, different words because different people relate to different um, descriptions. So heart-led entrepreneurs, service and relationship-based businesses. And I'm just going to, oops. Just, go, sorry. One thing I'm just gonna do. I'm gonna, no, I'll leave it. I see that there's a message in the chat window. There we go, I can see it now. Okay, Meryl's saying that the connection is very rocky. I'm not sure if others have the same challenge. Let me know. Um, hopefully it's not my end. I've got um, super fast internet, so, but do, do let me know if, there's, if anybody else is having an issue. Okay, Helen's saying it's not rocky. Per. Okay, uh, good to know. Um, and, and just let me know if, if other people have any issues with that usually it will tell me if my connection is is rocky so okay so yeah so who's this for so it's women who want to change the world change makers agents of change solopreneurs and usually the women that I work with are coaches healers teachers creatives wellness practitioners all that kind of stuff and in the main I work with um, online business owners um, just because that's been my experience, the business, the businesses that I have built over the last few years have been online. So that's where my experience and expertise is. So now about you, I'd love for you to just take a moment now to say hello in the chat. Um, if you missed the beginning where I was describing how to find the chat, if it's not obvious, you might have to hover over a black bar to find it. And just share in the chat where you are in the world, just so I can see where people are. So it's fun to, to see where people are. And just tell us a bit about what you do, whether your business or what you're offering in the world. And I'll just give you a, a moment or two to do that. while I have some tea. And while I wait, if, any, if anybody <laughs> is gonna join us in the chat and let us know where you are. I'm in Spain. Um, my name is Caroline Leon. I don't know if I said that at the beginning. My name is Caroline. Um, and I'm in Valencia in Spain. So I'm originally from the UK, but I, I live in Spain now with my partner and my baby. So we'll move on, but if you want to, okay, Helen's dropped in. Um, so she's calling in from Appleton, Wisconsin. She's a coach who helps women to take action. I'm a big fan of Helen's work. I would check her out if you don't know of her. Then we've got Donna B. Sorry, I was late. I'm in California. I'm a coach for moms and creative women who are struggling with self work. Oh, wonderful. That sounds incredible. Cindy from Ireland, a shiatsu therapist. I've had that treatment. It's incredible. Very, very incredible. And a reflexologist. I also love reflexology. Charlotte's in Brighton in the UK. 
Oh, wonderful. So we've got the States and we've got Ireland and England. Freelance design consultant. Wonderful. Thank you, ladies. Keep, keep um, adding stuff in there. And I'll move on. Mel from the Netherlands, trainer and coach. Help you all to shine at work and in their private lives. Wonderful. So you all, you're all ticking my, my ideal client list in terms of the people I was mentioning before and who I, who I work with and serve. So my intentions for, um, for today, basically, is to provide some practical guidance and inspiration for making the tr transition from amateur to pro in your business, to identify some of the ways in which you could be showing up more powerfully in your business, which really essentially is what Turning Pro is all about to provide you with some specific ideas, strategies, and tools for Turning Pro. And I'll be sharing a lot with you um, over the course of the class about what I've done in my journey to turn pro. I made my decision to turn pro back in 2014 when I read the book um, and worked with a business coach. And, I, and I, I made the decision, which we'll talk about in, the, in a moment. And also to give you a flavor of the type of classes we run in the Female Business Academy. So what I really wanted to do is give it for people who are interested in maybe joining us in the academy to get a sense of the kinds of topics and the kinds of uh, classes we run. So those are my intentions. And then we're going to jump in. Again, there's several points throughout the presentation where I'll um, ask if you've got any questions and you can pop them in the chat, but feel free to... Uh, pop your questions that come up as they come up in the chat and I'll, when we get to those points, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure I check in. So, first section of, of, the, of the class, the amateur, and this is where um, I remember when I first read the book, I bristled a bit. It can be a hard message to hear, um, and as I said earlier, Stephen Pressfield in the book doesn't pull any punches when he comes to describing the amateur. Um, and the, the key distinction that he makes is, um, he talks a lot about addiction versus calling. And so I'll be talking about that a bit more in more detail. Um, and yeah, so some of the language can be maybe a bit um, off-putting, but bear with it because um, it makes a lot of sense when we get into it. So I'm going to read a quote from, from the book from Stephen Pressfield. So when we're living as amateurs, we're running away from our calling meaning our work, our destiny, the obligation to become our truest and highest self. Addiction becomes a surrogate for our calling. Why? Because to follow a calling requires work. It's hard, it hurts. It demands entering the pain zone of effort, risk, and exposure. So just to, just to get it out there on the table, um, you know, turning pro is not, is not for the faint-hearted, let's put it that way. So... The characteristics of the amateur, and apologies if, you, if the bells are distracted in the background. I live in the historical center of the city and we're surrounded by churches. We've got the cathedral, we have churches. Yeah, I'm, there's about five churches, so um, hopefully the bells aren't too annoying. Um, most people like the sound of bells, but when you've lived in the middle of five churches for two years, they can get a bit tiresome. So characteristics of the amateur. The, and again, a lot of the distinctions that I use, not all of them come from the book, um, and, uh, but also I've added through you know, um, what I've learned on this journey of transitioning from amateur to pro. So always planning to start tomorrow. So you know, kind of shying away from taking the action and, and um, you know, when they're talking about their business and, and what they want to achieve in the world and their vision, it's always for tomorrow. It's always what they're planning to do and they're not actually in it or doing it. Chooses addiction over calling. So I just wanted to say a few words about addiction because it's quite a strong word. Um, but we, in the context of this transition from amateur to pro, we're talking about things like addiction to approval, addiction to distraction, which I think most of us, if we're really... Um, honest with ourselves would hold our hands to addiction to numbing out so not facing um, difficult decisions or difficult emotions and we numb out in a number of ways it can be through alcohol it can be through food it can be through watching mindless tv it can be lots of things so you know when he talk, when we talk about addiction in this context it can be you know, hardcore addiction to drugs and alcohol and other things, but it can also be, you know, the things that maybe we would be hesitant to call addiction, uh, but definitely do apply in this, in this distinction between the amateur and the pro. 
So the amateur is also dependent on external validation and lives by the opinions of others. And actually, when we're in amateur mode, um, it's the thing that, act, that stops us and holds us back the most in our businesses is this fear of what will, what will other people say. Martha Beck talks about it a lot in Finding Your North Star, where she talks about how, I think she describes it as the other. We all have um, this kind of like collective mass that we have in our minds um, of, of how people will judge us when we go to do something. So often if we want to do something risky, um, and put something out there online or, you know, um, create a new product or service. We have this idea of what people will think and we, and we lump them into this, like, you know, this group of, of, of people that, that don't really exist. And often it can be like one or two voices of maybe usually family members in my experience and, and from working with clients, often it's a, a parent or an aunt or a teacher that you know somebody that's had an influence on us and we have their voice of disapproval in our head and we kind of allocate that to everybody so the amateur lives in that space you know of, of living their lives by the opinions of others the amateur is also disorganized and chaotic and easily distracted um, and and this probably the most crucial point is the amateur allows fear to stop her from taking action and I think that's, that's the way my amateur um, state used to show up the most in terms of, you know, and often we don't realize it's fear. You know, we, we get stuck in overwhelm, we procrastinate, and we might give it, give it a number of names. Sometimes people will call themselves lazy or, you know, I'm, I'm just too busy. Or, but often it's fear. If, we're, if there's something that we say we want to do and we're not taking the action to do it, um, you can bet your bottom dollar that there's fear lurking somewhere in there. And so, um, so they're, the, they're the key characteristics of the amateur. And then another quote from Stephen Pressfield, the sure sign of the amateur is he has a million plans and they all start tomorrow. So that goes back to the planning point. So just in terms of, um, I just wanted to touch on, on you know, how, how in the book the amateur is kind of defined. And we will talk about it more. The rest of the presentation is more about, you know, the pro mindset and the, and the way the pro shows up in the world. Uh, and we'll, we'll refer back to the amateur. But is there any questions on that? Does anyone have any questions so far? And again, just pop them, just pop them in the chat. brought my cup of tea because I tend to start to lose my voice on these calls because I'm talking too much. Hopefully you've all got tea and coffee as well or whatever, whatever it is that you like to drink. Okay, I don't see any questions popping in. So the next section is deciding to turn pro. So this is a big thing. Um, something that I've realized in my journey over the years is that uh, one of the most important things we can ever do when it comes to taking action or, or undergoing a transformation or making a transition, which this is, um, we need to make the decision to do it. And so one of, the, one of the quotes in the book from Stephen is, turning pro is like kicking a drug habit or stopping drinking. It's a decision, a decision to which we must recommit every day. So I, you know, and I'll, I'll refer to it through this call, I talk often about my, my decision to turn pro back in 2014. I still have to recommit to that decision every day. It's not something that, oh, I turned pro and now I'm a pro and I never ever show up as an amateur. That's, not, that's really not true. It's not something that you, you know, once you decide to do it, you're, you're done. It's, this is something that, you know, we all show up as amateurs sometimes and we all show up as pros sometimes. And so, um, turning pro and kind of really stepping up powerfully in your business is something that you have to keep coming back to and keep coming back to. So like I've said, it's a decision that we, we need to make and it's a decision we often avoid taking and that's because it can mean scary things for us. Um, we'll look at it a bit uh, later on in terms of the fears that we might have about um, what it would mean if we really go for it. I mean, and that's what Turning Pro is. It's really going for um, our goal, our vision, uh, the thing that we want to do, the thing that we want to be known for, the thing that we want to create in the world. And so um, sometimes we might have attached certain um, 
limiting beliefs or beliefs to what it would mean to achieve our goals, what it would mean for us. And so one of the things that I realized um, early on in my journey was that I was very fearful of success. So often, you know, there's fears around fear of failure and fear of success. And for me, it was because I'd attached ideas around what it would mean to be successful in my business. And back then it was, you know, what would it, what would it mean for me to be a successful coach and run in a successful coaching business? And I'd attached all sorts of things like I, I will have to, you know, speak in public and I'll have to travel all, all over the world and I'll have to, you know, work like a crazy person and I'll have to churn out content all of the time and all of this stuff that just left me feeling overwhelmed and actually, you know, not really... Uh, wanting that success and it wasn't till I learned to redefine success for myself and what success would mean in my business that I was able to make the decision to go for it so so that's why often um, the decision to turn pro is one we avoid taking and and Stephen Festival says it's not turning pro is not for everyone he talks about you know in some ways you have to be kind of crazy to do it and it always makes me smile that bit in the book um, and it's because it really does mean showing up um, in the world in ways that you never have before. And so there is, you know, a cra- I mean, we already know that there's a craziness to what we're, we're doing. We've kind of uh, walked away from the conventional nine to five, working for somebody else. Just being an entrepreneur is crazy. Just being an entrepreneur is not for everyone. But turning pro is being an entrepreneur and taking it to the highest level. And so it's, it, it's like a new level of crazy. So it's not for everyone. And, um, and he talks about that quite a bit in the book. And so the other thing, the other reason it's a decision that we sometimes find difficult to take is that it requires us to own our amateur ways. So usually, and we're going to go into this in a lot more depth, we're going to go into mindset and habits and all of that stuff. Um, but, but usually, if we are showing up as an amateur, we'll have our reasons and our excuses that we use to defend the way we are showing up and so to make the decision to turn pro requires us to really call call ourselves out and face face the ways that we're not showing up powerfully in our business and again it's not a decision uh, that we only make once it's one that we we revisit and so but the good news is that when we um when we do make the decision to turn pro, what happens, as Stephen Festival says, when we turn pro is we finally listen to that still small voice inside our heads. At last we find the courage to identify the secret dream or love or bliss that we have known all along with our passion, our calling, our destiny. So for me, that that quote really speaks to the benefits of turning pro. You know, um, it really means, you know, going for it, following our destiny and 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 identifying and following our passion which to me is the only way to live um so now what i'd like you to do is turn to your workbook if you haven't been able to print it out like i said um just for anyone maybe who was late at the beginning if you scroll to the beginning of the chat if you didn't have a chance to download the workbook there was a link to it there um if you can't print it off, then feel free to just jot these down in a notebook. Or um, if you're feeling brave, share your answers in the chat. I'd love to, I'd love to hear um, people's answers to this. So the first question is, what scares you about turning pro? So I shared a little bit about, you know, my fear of success and why um, I, I was, what I identified as the reason I was holding myself back from really going for it with my business. And I've talked about it before, um, but the way it kind of manifested that fear of success was this idea of what if I don't want to get out of bed? You know, what if I wake up and I've got this really successful business and all of these people that re- rely and depend on me and I don't want to get out of bed. I just don't feel like working today. And that was the thing that I just, it took me, I mean, it was, I was working with a business coach, so he helped me through it and helped me realize a, that if I didn't feel like getting out of bed, I didn't have to. And I always have control. I can cancel, um, 
my clients, I can cancel my workshops, you know, the world won't come to an end if I decide to put my, my health and my self care first. So, so have a think now about what it is for you that might feel scary about turning pro. And again, using the term turning pro to mean really, really, really going for it in your business, really showing up in ways that you know that you want to, but haven't been so far. And if anyone wants to share in the chat, I'd love to hear. And then also take a moment to just jot down um, any ways that you know, if you're really, really honest with yourself, the ways you're showing up as an amateur. And so it might be spending countless hours on Facebook, just getting lost. You know, one of the ways I do it is that I, I, <laughs> I have like 10 million windows open on my laptop at any one time when I'm trying to do something important. I do this less now that I have a baby and I only work part time. Um, but when I used to have all day to, to work on my business, it was quite easy for me to just uh, get completely lost on the internet. Not necessarily Facebook, I could get lost in Googling all sorts of ridiculous random things and then you fall down a rabbit hole and before you know it, you're like two hours have passed and you might know a lot of new stuff, but it's nothing that's helpful um, or productive. So that was one of the ways I used to do it. Also, another way that I would show up as, a, as an amateur was uh, in sabotaging behavior. So sometimes people, I would get inquiries from people who would want to work with me and I would purposely, not, real, not realizing, not consciously, but I would um, not write back, you know, for a week. I'd let things, I'd let things slip that would that I knew would take my business to the next level. Um, you know, not getting back to people quickly enough, not getting back to people powerfully enough, all of that stuff. So have a think now about the ways in which you um, are not showing up powerfully in your business. And then, and again, if anybody's brave enough to share, feel free to put something in the chat I'd love to hear. And then uh, the third question that I'd like you to take some notes on and just jot down. And if you don't feel you have time in the workshop, you know, feel free to take these questions and journal after the call's finished. But what would it mean for you to finally stop running away from your calling? Like, what would that, what would that mean for your life? Would it mean that you finally can stop worrying about money? Would it mean that you finally feel the fulfillment that maybe you're lacking? Would it mean that you finally have the impact that you know that you can have on the world? Like, what would it mean for you to finally stop um, running away from your calling? And running away from your calling is how Stephen Festival describes the, the amateur. And so I'm just going to pop, I see someone's put something in the chat. So Charlotte says, my fear is of failure and not being good enough, but also a fear of becoming too successful and becoming overwhelmed. Ah, I feel I'm showing up as an amateur by not having enough self-belief. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, great share. I think that's a, that's a big one. I mean, we can have the fear of failure and the fear of success, and that's just like a double whammy. Um, one thing I would say, though, Charlotte, there is not having, um, like having self-doubt isn't necessarily an amateur trait, um, it, but it's allowing that self-doubt or lack of self-belief to stop you from moving forward. And we talk about that a bit later on. So it's not like the professional never doubts themselves and it's not like the professional doesn't feel fear. They just don't allow that fear or that self-doubt to get in the way of their mission and their vision. So I just wanted to say that, but thank you. Thank you very much for sharing. And then take a note, and again, this would be a great one to share in the chat because for a bit of accountability and you're putting it out there, but what's one thing that you think you could do this week that would demonstrate your decision? Oh, I see a typo there, it's not decision one. Um, that you could do this week to demonstrate your decision to turn pro. So um, have a think, it could be, um, it could be anything and it might be that might be a question to come back to at the end of the workshop because then you'll have a ton of ideas of what you could do to turn pro but if anything is occurring to you now jot it down share it in the chat um, and make a note of it so any questions on that section on the on the making the decision to turn pro okay let's crack on then I thought we'd be done in an hour and it's already flying by. So the, um, now we're going to look at mindset and we're going to go through some of the characteristics. Um, oops. 
Yeah, some of the characteristics of the pro. You'll, uh, one thing I want to say, the workbook, the back of the workbook, if you use in the link that I've shared in the chat, or if you use the link in some of the later reminders, has at the back a turning pro checklist. And it's, it's a list of all the characteristics that the pro has, according to Stephen Pressfield in the book. If yours doesn't have that checklist at the back, it's because my initial version didn't and then I decided to add it in later on. So just go to one of the later emails or use the link in, in the chat and you'll have that, that list. But what I've done for the purposes of, of the presentation is picked out the ones that I think are really important and key and gone into those a little bit deeper. So, Okay, I think the slide's in the wrong place. So maybe we're gonna come back to that because that's about habits and it's not actually in my notes. So I'll just ignore that for now. So, um, so in terms of the mindset, the mindset of the professional, for the professional, the stakes are high and real. And so just to explain that, what I wanna share with you, um, well, what I want you to do is think back to when you started a new job. And so I like to use this example because we all have, for example, uh, fear, fear of failure, fear of not being good enough, um, all of that stuff in, or we probably did in our old life, in our, in our previous work. If we, did, if, we had, if we did nine to five or we had a corporate job, um, we will have experienced similar self-doubt, maybe not as... Um, maybe not as extreme because you know, we're working for somebody else and it's not putting ourselves out there in the same way. But for sure, if you think back to any time that you've started a new job in your life, you will have had fear and self-doubt. But my guess is that you didn't fail to take action because of that fear, because to have done so would mean that you were fired. You know, So if you think back to a job, a new job that you started whenever that might have been, um, and, and, and think about how the stakes, how high and real the stakes would have felt back then. That's what kind of moves you forward to take action. There's something, I don't know why, about being an entrepreneur and running your own business that seems to allow us to let fear sabotage our uh, taking action um, and moving forward. So... So what I want to, the point I'm trying to make here is, you know, for the professional, the stakes are high and real for their business, for their art. He talks a lot, um, he's a writer, so he's often talking about artists and writers when he's talking about the turning pro, but also entrepreneurs. Um, and so also, what, what would it mean in terms of the stakes? What would it mean for you to turn your back on your calling? So often again, I mean, this is what I do to, to really motivate me and, and move me forward is I think about the alternative. What's the alternative to being successful, to really showing up fully for my business and my calling? It means the alternative is turning my back on it. And sometimes it's easy to put that reality um, on the back burner and, and swim around in overwhelm and all of that stuff. Um, and for me, making sure, you know, being fully aware of, of how high and real the stakes are, of not succeeding at my passion. And, if, you know, for me, ultimately, what it would mean is going back to the corporate world and, and getting a nine to five job. And that is, you know, is a very scary thought. I haven't worked for somebody else since 2012. And so um, I keep that at the forefront of my mind. And that's what keeps me pro that's what stops me from playing at my business or, or being an amateur in my business another question that i like to ask is will you have deathbed regret how will you feel in your life at the end of your life if you haven't followed your passion and calling to the highest degree i mean and this is the thing this is a this is the kind of catch-22 because um if we don't fulfill our potential to the to our highest potential we're gonna have regret at some point in the future. But a lot of us, what we do, and I've done this myself, is we hold back because we think, well, if I give it everything I've got and then I fail, you know, I'm screwed. You know, what does that, what does that say about me? And so there's often this um, hesitancy about giving, giving our all and giving everything we've got because if we, if we do that and then fail, 
will be devastated. It will be heartbreaking. Um, you know, I'm here to tell you that, you know, my best bet is if you go all in and give everything you've got to turn in pro in your business, you won't fail. That's the, that's the greatest determiner of success. So just something to consider there. Um, and then also, are you content to play small because of what others might think? So this is going back to the amateur way of being dependent on the opinion of others. Um, do you want to, I mean, this ties to the deathbed regret. Do you want to get to the end of your life and realize that you've lived it for other people? That you didn't do, you know, those live videos or run those workshops or do that retreat in Bali or whatever it might be because... Um, you were worried you might fail or you were worried what people would say or that you would be judged if you, if you messed it up. Are you content um, to do that, to, to live your life in that way? And then finally, what, what gifts are you denying the world of? Um, I, one of my favorite coaches, um, Rich Litvin, I remember watching him coaching a woman um, uh, live, you know, or I was watching the video of it. And she had this, you know, fear of not enoughness and fear of failure and fear of um, all the fears, all the fears that we all experience. And at one point he just said to her, and he's, he's quite brutal, but at one point he just said to her, you know, how selfish are you? You know, you're, what, you're, what you're doing is so selfish because you're denying the people in your audience and, you know, your potential clients, you're denying them of your gift. And I, and, and you know, the way he said it when he first called her selfish, it, it felt quite brutal, but it's really true. And so consider um, in terms of uh, the stakes, you know, what you're denying the world of if you don't, if you play small and you stay, stay as an amateur. And I'm just checking in the chat. So um, Donna says, my fear is about time and not being able to be consistent. I'm a single mom and parenting my daughter is my priority. I'm also a cancer survivor. Yay. So I have fear of getting sick here and having to go back and quit my business. Yeah, very real fears. Very real. Um, yeah. And so it's, I don't actually go into it in, in this workshop specifically, but there's so much I could say on how to create your business in a way that, um, that, that serves your needs. Um, it's a, I'm afraid it's a different workshop, but um, Donna, feel free to reach out to me after the, after the call if you want to discuss that or hear more on that. Um, okay. And so another quote from Stephen. I love him and I love the book. To feel ambition and to act upon it is to embrace the unique calling of our souls. Not to, not to act upon that ambition is to turn our backs on ourselves and on the reason for our, our existence. So that's just, that I, I chose that quote because for me, it's a real demonstration of how high and real mistakes are. What we're talking about here is turning our back on ourselves, turning our back on the reason for our existence. So um, pretty high stakes, I think. So moving on, um, so yeah, th again, this is something that he says in the book, uh, the professional is committed over the long haul. And so um, commitments are a really, a really important topic for me. And so a question to ask yourself is how committed you are to your vision. Um, and I always ask people when they talk about commitment or they're considering their commitment is to check their language. You know, um, another coach that I love, uh, Steve Chandler, talks about commitment as a place. There's a place in our brain that we put things when we're truly committed. And he uses the example of catching a flight. So imagine um, that you, were, you said to somebody uh, or somebody said to you, do you want to come to my free workshop in two weeks? And you said, no, I'm actually, I'm going to be on holiday in two weeks. I, you know, I've got a luxury um, two week holiday in the, the Caribbean. Um, and the other person says, well, that's two weeks away. You know, who knows what might happen? Um, you know, surely, you know, maybe you can come and you're like, no, no, I'm going to be on that plane you know, come hell or high water. And so there's something, I, I like that example because when we know when we've completely committed to something and I hear it all the time in my work with coaching clients, you know, people will say, I'll try and get it done. I'll try to do that. I'll try to, you know, turn pro. I'll try to be more organized. I'll try to find the time. Um, and that's not the language of commitment. So being committed over the long haul is 
it's you know it you know it in your language you know it in the way you describe your commitment um it's in a different place in your brain it's not in the i'll try and be successful i'll try and make this work it's i'm going to make this work if it kills me um and so um and then you can't avo avoid the storm so there's a quote i love um which is something like i didn't write it down but it's something like um life is not about avoiding the storm it's learning to dance in the rain so one of the things that can challenge our commitment over the long haul is that is the is the lows of the entrepreneurial journey you know there's lots of benefits there's the freedom there's there's lots of highs in in running our own business but there's also lots of lows and lots of dips and it can be very um it can be a very difficult and lonely journey sometimes so being aware that you can't avoid the storm um is is super important um and being prepared to weather the storm and learn to dance in the rain um, is super important in terms of your commitment to the long haul. And then stopping short of the gold, I put that just as a prompt for me. There's a bit that I, um, I want to read to you that I've got written down because um, I love this story, but I always butcher it because I don't remember the details exactly. So I've, I've got it written down and I'm going to read it out to you. And it comes from... Um, Napoleon Hill's book, Think and Grow Rich, which is a book, if you haven't read it, that's all about um, his study of successful people and, and kind of pulling out the traits and the habits and the, and, and the, and the actions of uh, the, the most successful people in, in life. So in the book, Napoleon Hill tells the story of Are You Harvey? Harvey's uncle had gold fever, so he staked his claim and started digging. After a lot of hard work, the uncle found a vein of ore, so he covered up his find and returned home to raise the money for the machinery that he would need to bring the ore to the surface. They raised the money and Darby traveled with his uncle back to the site to make their fortune. Things started well, and before long they had enough to clear their debts. They were excited. Everything from here on would be profit and things were looking good. Then the supply of gold stopped. The vein of ore had disappeared. They kept on digging but found nothing. After a while, they quit in frustration and sold their machinery to a junk man for a few hundred dollars. This is a true story, by the way. Um, after they went home in disappointment, the astute junk man called in a mining engineer who checked the mine and calculated that there was a vein of gold just three feet from where Darby and his uncle had stopped digging. The junk man went on to make millions from the mine. Darby returned home, paid back everyone who had lent him money and was determined to learn from his mistake in giving up too soon. He then went on to become a phenomenally successful insurance salesman, more than recouping, recouping what he would have made from the gold mine. He learned the lesson that you need to persevere through difficulties and stay focused if you are to become successful. Whenever you feel like giving up on your dream, remember that you may be just three feet in gold. So I share that because for me, it's a really important um, uh, aspect of the mindset of a professional, this idea that, um, you know, of being determined. I often think of it in terms of, um, I think of it like a really long race, like a marathon where, um, or even way longer than a marathon where people are, you know, falling like flies, dropping out at several stages. And by the end of this epic journey, this epic race, you know, you've got the survivors, the people that, that, you know, made it, the people that stayed the course um, and, and stayed, stayed for the long haul. And for me, whenever I, whenever I hit a rough spot in my business or I start to, you know, doubt myself or I think it would be easier to go back to the nine to five or all of those stuff because we all do it, we all have it. I remember this story. I remember this idea of stopping short of the goal and know of, of the gold um, and know that the, the true determiner of success is staying in it for the long haul. So now I just want you to um, have a quick think about your commitment to your business over the long haul and, and just give yourself on a scale of one to 10, a rating for how committed you are with 10 being like, I'm 100% committed. I am not going to give up on this. It, even if it kills me, that would be a 10 and uh, one obviously not committed at all. I don't think I'm ever even going to do it. Um, so if anyone wants to share, it would be wonderful to see your scores in the chat if anyone wants to share. Meryl's a nine. Great. I love it. 
Sydney's an 11. Amazing. That's the spirit. That's, that's a pro right there. We've got a pro amidst us. Um, wonderful. I mean, and, and I would say I'm a 10. I'm completely a 10. It's like, I will not, like, failure is not an option. That's, that's the kind of mindset and attitude we're going for. And it, it, I'm curious with the nines, um, what, what that, what that, um, what's missing? What would make it a 10? If you feel like sharing that, what, what, why is it short? Why are you falling short of a 10 there? Um, feel free to share in the chat. Be, I'd be interested in to hear. Dutch cow. <laughs> That's my role. I love it. Okay. So, and it's just useful for you to know that and check in with yourself in terms of, you know, where your commitments are for your business. I think it's really important. And, and, and if you're not sure and, you, and it's a question you're like, think about the language you use, watch it, watch your language when you talk about your new projects or your new, okay. Oh yeah. Yeah, that makes sense, Donna. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure, actually. I would stop. <laughs> I would for my baby. I was scared. This made me realize that I'm doing this one. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a good realization, Charlotte. So Charlotte's saying, um, this is scary because it's made me realize that I'm doing this mostly because I feel it's the best option for me financially, but I need to think about which aspects I'm really passionate about. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's a really good thing for you to do. Um, yeah. Yeah, okay. Moving on. So another um, characteristic of the professional is um, taking action in the face of fear. So um, something that um, Stephen talks about in the book is the fact that both the amateur and the professional experience fear. There's no difference. You don't become fearless when you turn pro. Uh, in fact, I don't really believe that fearlessness exists. Um, I think we all experience fear and I think it's an important emotion, but we mustn't, as pros, allow it to stop us from taking action. Um, so some of, the, some of the things that um, come up for me when I think about taking action in the face of fear is realizing that overwhelm is a choice. So one of the biggest ways I used to stop myself in the past and, and kind of like paralyze myself in some ways was by choosing to be overwhelmed. Um, and the first time I heard the idea that overwhelm was a choice, I felt like I'd been slapped across the face. It felt so um, contrary to what I, I then believed. Um, but I now see that it is a choice. I see all of the ways in which I overwhelm myself. And maybe you might recognize some of these things like having a million windows open on your computer at any one time, trying to do 10 different things, you know, thinking about everything that you need to do on your project or in your business at the same time, rather than focusing on just one thing. Um, and so once I realized that overwhelm was a choice, I started to see the ways in which I was choosing it, and then I made a different choice. So I'll talk about those a bit later on in terms of when I share my stuff and how I, I deal with overwhelm. Um, recognizing our thoughts for what they are. So fear, fear I, I talk about this a lot. We live in the feeling of our thoughts. So if we feel scared, it's because we're thinking scary thoughts. And if we can recognize that that fear is just the result of scary thoughts um, and that thoughts actually can't do anything, they're literally just thoughts that they can't, they can't actually do anything to us, then, um, then we can start to shift. So for sure I get scared. Um, and fearful when I take big leaps in my business, but I, I see the fear and I recognize it and I carry on regardless. Um, one, of the, one of the quotes I shared, I'm not gonna quote it because I'm just rem remembering it, but um, is this idea that um, you know, you're going on a road trip and fear is gonna be in the car because fear likes to come along for these things. And, um, it can be in the car, it's fine to be in the car, but what it can't be is it can't be in the driving seat and it can't uh, be in charge of the map. 
I'm, I'm butchering that. I, I'll share the, I should have printed the quote after that. But, um, but it's this idea that fear can be there. It doesn't have to stop us. It doesn't have to stop us from moving forward. And then one small step at a time. So this is the, this is the kind of combat to the overwhelm. So um, if we're not choosing overwhelm, we're choosing to take one small step at a time um, and take an action. And here, um, Helen, who's, in, who's joining us on the call, this is her area of expertise, taking small steps. Um, and then cultivating the courage to confront your own doubts and demons. Um, so often what we do is we don't, it's not comfortable to look at our doubts and demons. It's not, it's, it's not comfortable to really sit down and face our fears. So what we do is that's where the addiction side comes in. We numb out, you know, when we sit there and we get lost for three hours scrolling through Facebook, it, that's us avoiding looking at ourselves down. Um, so cultivating the courage to sit down and really work out what those fears are and what they mean is huge. And it's a huge way um, to move past allowing fear to stop us from taking action. Um, and one of the things that I found in my journey is that when, I, when my mind gets quiet, when I can get to this space of um, not attaching to my thinking, not getting lost in my fearful thinking, um, action becomes easy. It's not something that I have to force myself to do. Um, so sometimes when people, you know, worry about being busy or um, having too much on and all of that stuff, and I, you know, if I open a Facebook group, for example, I have to do all of these things. When you're not in a in a fear space, when you when you detach from your fearful thinking, action is so much easier. It's almost like you're being pulled forward rather than having to drag yourself to do things. Um, there's a whole different energy behind your action taking. Um, and I'm sure that, that you all have examples of when that, that's that been the case in your life. And it's like, oh, that was surprisingly easy to do. Or you do something, you know, you're super productive and get an incredible amount of stuff done in a day that normally would have taken you two weeks. That's because the fear, you've left the fear out of it. Um, and you've, you know, this self-doubt hasn't managed to get in the way, basically. So, yeah, also on mindset, something that, that feels really important to talk about here is uh, the growth versus the fixed mindset. So the amateur has a fixed mindset and the amateur would say, I'm not that kind of person. You know, I'm not, I'm not capable of public speaking. They might say something like, I know that the best thing for my business might be to do Facebook lives, but I'm, I'm no good at public speaking. So it's just not going to happen. A growth mindset, a pro mindset says, I can't do it now, but I'll find a way and I'll learn how to do it. And, and also the distinction between the growth and the fixed mindset is um, in a fixed mindset, we believe that we have fixed traits. You know, I'm, I'm this kind of person or I'm not that kind of person. I, I show up in this way and I don't show up in that way versus things that are skills. So for example, oh, I'm terrible. I use public speaking as, as an example a lot because um, I think it's, a, it's quite a relevant one. A lot of people will say, I'm just not. You know, I'm not someone, I'm rubbish at public speaking. I'm not someone who can do it. It's not a skill I have. Well, um, it, it's something that you can learn. You know, it's not something that I, I can do. Um, I remember actually witnessing a conversation where a family member of mine said to my partner, um, you're so lucky that you have, you know, that you're, you have the ta you, you're talented at public speaking. And we both like, I mean, as coaches, we both kind of like leapt on her because it was like, no, you know, this is something, this is a skill that he has developed over time and he's faced fear and he's, you know, worked hard to be someone who can now stand up in front of a room with a very little preparation and speak publicly, but it's taken time to get there. Um, so this growth mindset, um, and in the book, and I also talk about this a lot, um, I talk about the concept of mastery. Um, so, you know, taking, taking the approach of I will master my skills, I will become a master at, um, 
at my skills. And that's what happened to me when I decided, you know, I started my business and then in the first couple of years of my business, it was like, I'm going to master coaching. I'm going to, I'm going to read every coaching book I can find. I'm going to work super hard to become the best coach that I can be. And then when I felt like, you know, I, I mean, not that you ever stop learning. I still, I'm still learning all the time to um, improve my skills at coaching, but I then wanted to get really good at uh, business. It was like, okay, now I want to learn everything that there is to learn about how to build a successful business. And that's when I was inspired to create the Academy because I thought if I'm going to do all of this work and all of this research and all of this, um, growth, I'm going to share it. I'm going to share it with, um, other women. So again, also under this, um, aspect of mindset is seeing failure as an opportunity for growth. So often what I see with, um, with a lot of people, I mean, I, I, I do think it's something that I see more with women, but I, I've seen it with men as well, is um, rather than seeing failure as, rather than take it personally and seeing it as something, um, you know, that makes us wrong or makes us not enough, we see, we see it, the pro sees it as an opportunity for growth. The pro sees something um, as a failure that's independent of themselves. So, so it's not that I, the professional, am a failure. I have failed. It's that this thing, this email, this, this course, this marketing approach, this whatever it might be, failed. Now, let's look at how um, I can improve that. Let's look at why it failed and let's look at how I can grow or how I can improve my skills to make it work better next time. So that's what the pro does. Um, the amateur will, will experience failure and then go, oh my God, I'm not good enough and I'm a disaster and I might as well give up now. So it's, it's, they identify with the failure in a way that the pro doesn't. The pro just sees failure as feedback um, and that's really important. Okay, moving on. So back to um, taking action. So back to the workbook. If Again, if you've got the workbook printed out um, or you want to jot some of these things down, um, some questions for you to consider and journal on. I realize we're at the hour and we're, we're not finishing. So we're, we are going to run over the hour a bit. Um, so what limiting self-beliefs are you holding on to that are holding you back from truly turning pro? So again, if you feel inspired to share, do share. And then also where in my business am I adopting a fixed versus a growth mindset? So where, where can you think of yourself as saying, oh, I'm just no, the, the, the classic way is I'm just no good at X. You know, what do you say about yourself in that vein? Like, what do you tell people or tell yourself that you're just no good at? Um, and kind of leave it there rather than see it as an opportunity to grow. And as a result of what you've learned so far in the workshop, and again, this is a question you can come back to later, um, what new attitudes or beliefs would you like to take on in terms of turning pro? So if anyone wants to share anything on this in the chat, feel free. But I'm not gonna hang around too much. I'm gonna keep going, but I will. Yeah, so I don't think I'm bad at videos, big one for me. No, I really, what I really want to share with you here is I said it for so long, so, so long. And every time that I asked my audience for feedback on what they wanted to see more of from me, they said video. And it, I used to shrivel inside every time someone told me that I should do video. And then I did, um, this is not that long ago, and the women in my academy will uh, witness this. I did a a challenge, a free challenge with a woman called Alison Crow, who I would recommend checking out if you haven't heard of her. And she, she does a, a free Facebook live channel, a uh, uh, challenge. And I did it. And I had to do a Facebook live every day for 10 days. And I did it. And it was the scariest thing that I've ever had to do. And now I do Facebook lives for breakfast. Like I, I just, now I love it. Now I'm like, I absolutely love it. I haven't done one for a while because I've been super, super busy with the, with the launch for the Academy, but I love it. And so I am living proof that you can go from the I'm bad at video to actually just getting over it and doing it. So um, I just wanted to share that with you. Oh, I have ADD. Yeah, that's one I also used to have. I used to say it all the time. 
I can't focus. I, I can't concentrate for long enough. Yeah. Donna's saying, I used to say I was bad at audio and now I have a podcast so I know I can change it. Exactly. So, so you, you recognize it. Cindy's saying video all the way. And I have trained as a photographer and I've been to it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I get it. I really do get it. But I'm, I, I promise you, I mean, some of you will, and you'll have all done it. They'll all, we, we can probably all find examples where we, um, you know, used to say, I can't do it. It's not something I can do. And then we somehow some found a way and we can do it. So, so have a list those out. Um, list those out and start to maybe challenge yourself to, to, to challenge your own thinking about that. Move into the growth mindset. So moving on to habits. Okay, and that's where that slide I put in the wrong place um, was going to come in handy. So luckily I've got it here. Let me see. So um, this is a quote from the book about habits. So the difference between an amateur and a professional is in their habits. An amateur has amateur habits. A professional has professional habits. We can never free ourselves from ourselves from habits as a human being is a creature of habit but we can replace bad habits with good ones we can trade in the habits of the amateur and the addict for the practice of the professional and the committed artist or entrepreneur so that's good news we can change our habits so the habits of a pro uh, the pro keeps regular working hours while the amateur might work when she feels like it the pro sets clear goals on a regular basis, while the amateur wings it and hopes for the best. The pro reviews her progress and adjusts accordingly, and the amateur, as I said earlier, takes failure personally and is too busy worrying about her worth to review and adjust. So this is something that I definitely see, uh, I've seen men do, and it's something that I, I really struggled with for a long time, this idea of testing, you know, testing different things. Um, my partner does it all the time. He'll do a, I'll do an advert on Facebook, uh, on Facebook and it, and it won't work. And then I'll be like, oh, I can't do Facebook adverts, you know, he'll do a Facebook advert and then he'll tweak it a million times and test it till it works, till he makes it work. So, um, that's where I'm a bit amateur sometimes. If it doesn't work, I kind of think, well, that didn't work rather than, okay, well, what if I tweaked it in this way? Would it work? You know, testing it rather than taking that failure personally and thinking I'm just no good at X. Um, the pro makes her business a priority. Um, and it doesn't have to be the only priority. And bearing in mind, um, you know, people with families and other priorities, but, but they do make it a priority. Um, the amateur, however, puts everything and everyone before her business. Um, so I've seen it a lot with people who are like, oh, yeah, I really want to do this in my business, but I've got some friends coming to stay for a week, so I can't. Well, in my house, in this house, we treat our, because we treat our businesses like they are jobs, like we have to turn up to a nine to five and we have to be there or we'll be fired. Um, we, we do approach it in that way. Um, if people come to stay, there's nothing to stop people coming to stay. We often have visitors here, but they know between certain hours we will be working uh, and people are fine with it. And they're like, you know, that's great. We'll entertain ourselves and we'll see you when you're not working. So um, it can be done. But it's just really important that you make your business a priority in the way that you would make a nine to five job a priority because you would have to. Um, and then the pro builds her business with success in mind. So, and, and with success in mind and with expansion in mind. So, so by that, what I mean is um, often, and I get the resistance because I talk a lot about turning pro, kind of like taking things to the next level, getting very strategic. And a lot of people, um, come to me and they say, well, do I really need to? I'm only a, you know, I'm only a solopreneur. My, you know, I don't think I need to have like a business plan or a strategy or a formal vision or all of these things, you know, for my business. Um, and what I would say is that's an amateur way of showing up because the pro builds their business knowing that one day it's going to be bigger than it is today. They build it with success and with expansion in mind. Um, and there's lots of ways you can do that. Um, and we'll talk about that a bit later in terms of having um, appropriate and professional systems and processes in place. Um, 
which then it becomes so much easier to grow your business and hire a, a VA if you want to, or expand your team if you want to, whatever it might be. So then just to share with you um, a little bit about my habits and um, how I've kind of moved my habits more into the professional realm. Um, I get up early and I go to bed early. There is nothing more sacred in this house uh, than eight hours of sleep, even with, even with um, an eight month old baby. And so it's really sacred to me that I, and I probably don't get a whole eight hours, but I make sure that I'm in bed for um, at the very least eight hours. Um, I'm still waking up for um, some nighttime feeds with the, with the Baba. So um, it's not a full eight hours, but I, I, I really, really commit to that. And I do it because I know that my state of mind is everything to my success in business. And my t and tiredness com compromises my, my state of mind. Then morning rituals. Um, I have, over the years, I've had various different rituals. Now I have the lightest ritual that I can, again, because I have a baby. I, I work part-time on my business and I, and I look after, I co-parent my baby with my partner. Um, and so before I had rituals where I would do yoga and meditate and morning pages and all sorts of stuff. Now I do 10 minutes on my cushion um, and I meditate and I, and I have a mantra that I like to use. And so it's a very, very scaled back ritual, but I do it because um, it sets me up for success and it makes my day run smoother and I feel better and it helps with the whole um, state of mind. I also, another habit that I have is I decide my top three priorities for the next day, the night before, and that really helps me with the overwhelm. And it's, and sometimes I don't do it, but but I do it when I feel worried and I feel overwhelmed. And I think, oh God, I've got something so much to do tomorrow and I've only got half a day to do it. Um, that's when I will, I will go back to this. I call it the power of three. I'll write down the three most important things I need to get done the next day. And I write them on a piece of paper or my notebook and I put it on my keyboard in my office on my desk. Um, I business journal. That's another habit that I'm, um, I've started to cultivate. It was an idea that was introduced to me by um, a woman called Carrie Green, who I'd also check out if you if you um, if you're interested. And she talks about keeping a business journal, which is amazing. To I, I I love to be able to kind of journal through the ups and the downs of the entrepreneurial journey, and it's hilarious because you know if I read back over my entries, it's like oh my god, it's amazing, everything is incredible, and then down into the depths of despair so it's kind of hilarious but also really helpful to to journal and then keeping a schedule um, I do have other priorities very big priorities I have, like I say I have a baby I co-parent my baby at home we don't have a nanny or or any childcare um, at this stage and so I I have to follow a really tight schedule um, in order to be able to do that so it's printed on my notice board. It's printed on the fridge. We stick to it like glue. Um, we're both, because both me and my partner work from home and look after the baby, we, we're both like fierce about protecting our, our work time. Um, and so, you know, that makes it easy to stick to that schedule. But it's super important for, for both of us to have that schedule. So now, again, referring back to the workbook, the take action section, three questions that I want you to um, answer. Which habits do you have that currently sabotage your success? And again, it means getting really honest with yourself. And again, if you want to share them in the chat, I'd love to see them. What about your daily routine needs to change to support your transition to pro? Like, for example, are you consistently not getting enough sleep? Are you consistently drinking on a school night and then feeling crappy the next day? Are you consistently wasting time on social media? Um, and then telling yourself you don't have enough time. Um, that's been one of the great things about having a baby, actually, because when your time is limited, you suddenly, you, you do focus. Going back to what you were saying, Meryl, I learned to focus. I learned to focus because I had to. Um, I cannot get distracted now, otherwise I just wouldn't get things done. Um, and which habits or routines could you begin to incorporate that would lead to greater success? So could you create a morning routine? Um, that you currently don't have that sets you up for success that that's going to help you start the day in the right way um, have a think about those questions make any notes share anything in the chat if you feel like it 
but we will. I am going to move swiftly on because of time. So any questions on that? Just let me know in the chat and I'll answer them. I can, I've got the chat up here so I can see if anyone puts anything in there. And then we're going to look at environment. So um, before we get into the slides, I want to read a, I want to read a, a piece from the book, which I love on this. So this is where he, it's a section in the book. And if you haven't read the book, Turning Pro, I highly recommend it. All the women in my academy, I think now have bought it and read it. So um, I love it. It's a beautiful book. Um, and it's all little small sections. And so this one is, a practice has a space. And he's talking about the professional mindset as a practice. Um, a practice has a space and that space is sacred. There's a wonderful book called Where Women Create. It's a compilation of photos of studios and workshops where various female artists do their magic. The workspaces are those of potters and weavers, quilters and dressmakers, architects and sculptors, painters, filmmakers, editors. The book has an excellent text, but you don't need to read it. Just look at these sacred spaces. What you'll see is this. Order, commitment, passion, love, intensity, beauty, humility. 26 artists with 26 different personal odysseys. Many, no doubt, include divorce, heartbreak, alcoholism, you name it. But every woman in this book has, in her artistic life, transcended these impediments and everyone has arrived at the same space. They all serve the muse and each has discovered in that, in that service her unique and authentic essence. So I love that. I love that idea of creating a sacred space. Um, and... and you know that's that's it, it it's different it's going to different be different for different people like depending on your situation what that what that what that's going to look like is going to um differ so for example i have my own office but one of the things that i did is we chose to spend a bit more on rent um and push ourselves because it's when our business um we were just getting started with our businesses but push ourselves in that to get an apartment where we could both have our own office um, but if you don't have your own office it's important to create a space um, somewhere in your environment that allows you to do your work your sacred work um, and so you want to you want a space that's going to have minimal distractions you want to set clear clear boundaries around your space if you don't have for example a door that you can close and your space is you know in you're sharing your space in a house maybe you need to have a word with loved ones your family your housemates um, and put some boundaries around your space um, and you want to review the tools of your trade your environment is not just your desk or your office it's you know your computer it's your earphones it's your it's your everything that you use to do your business. Um, and the professional accepts no excuses is another um, line from the book. And so I'm going to give you an example of how I made a sacred space when I was living off the grid for a year, house sitting with my partner in Mexico, which was when I uh, really built my business. And we were living in a tiny rustic casita that had one main room and then a bedroom and a bathroom. And both me and my partner were working online. And so, um, and there were no desks. And I think my partner was at the kitchen table and I really wanted a desk. And we lived in the middle of nowhere. No joke. The nearest supermarket was a six hour round trip. And so what we did is we found some um, wood we found some old wood and you can see we were in the middle of the jungle and uh my partner helped me to build a desk so that i could have one and there's a, there's a picture of the completed desk in the corner <laughs> of this um this tiny casita that's essentially all of the casita the two doors that you can see at the back are um uh, the bedroom and the bathroom and that's the rest of the space and so um, it was super important that I had this sacred space for my business and we we made it happen um, no excuses so um, yeah there we go I missed that slide so so then coming to the back to your workbook um, three questions that I want you to answer take some time to ask ask yourself an answer either put them in the your answers in the chat or put them um or journal on them so what about your environment is currently sabotaging your success 
What changes could you make to your environment to make it more pro? And what upgrades to your equipment do you need to budget and plan for if you can't afford them right now? Okay. So that's it on the environment section. Again, any questions, pop them in the chat. And then now we're gonna look at leveraging your time. So this is where we look at tools, systems, uh, and processes. So the pro has professional systems in place that create a positive experience for the customer, um, a positive and a professional experience. And we'll talk a bit more about the kind of systems and tools um, that might look like. The pro automates tasks that would otherwise take her out of her zone of genius. And so that's avoiding things that we, we all have them. We have these tasks that we do over and over again um, that we could build into a system or a process or, or find software or a tool to automate them and, and we don't do, do it for whatever reason. Our amateur cell stops us. So um, the pro automates tasks um, in that way. And then the pro also looks at their business, sees a problem and finds uh, a system or a process to fix it rather than just complaining that this thing is, is a complete time suck or this thing is causing um, a problem. The pro finds a fix and a solution. And then um, the pro also makes sure she has the right tools for the job. So this can be a number of things and we're gonna go through those now. So in terms of tools that you might use, so these are the tools that I use in my business. So I use Trello, which is a kind of, uh, well, I, I mean, I use it as a business hub, but um, I don't know how it would describe itself if, if it's a project management or a to-do piece of software, but it's incredible. And I use it for everything. I use it for my uh, strategy. I use it for my planning. I use it for my uh, daily and weekly to-dos. I use it for lots and lots of things. It's kind of like my business hub. Um, and there's an amazing course called uh, Trello for Business that helps you set it up. Uh, in, in, in that way as a business hub that I highly recommend. Um, I use Canva to, to do my design. All of the slides that you see in this, I created in Canva first and then uploaded to uh, Keynote. I use Zoom because um, I used to use Skype for my coaching sessions, but I found that it, the connection was often not very good. Uh, I would have problems on the calls. And for me, it was important to invest in something that was more professional and also was easier for the, for the client to record their calls, for example. Um, so what I used to do is I used to have a call recorder, record the calls, and then I'd have to upload them to um, Google Drive and then send the link and it would take too long and I'd, or I'd forget and be busy and so this was a way to automate um, tasks and to, and to save a lot of time on my part and to create that more professional experience for the customer. I use Google Apps for my emails, um, I use Hootsuite to automate social media, I use MailChimp for all my emails, iMovie to edit my videos, PayPal for my um, for my payments and member press for my female business academy. And so these are all, uh, they're a combination of software, plugins, um, but there were a variety of tools that I used to make my business more professional. Um, and then in terms of systems and processes, um, these are just a couple of areas where I put systems and processes in place to avoid repetition and to be more professional. So things like new client welcome, rather than every time I take a new client on, you know, thinking about um, what I want to say to them and what things I want to um, send them. And uh, what I did is I created a whole PDF uh, welcome document. I had a section on my website for clients and I, I just send them to that link and it's all done and automated. I don't have to repeat that work every time I take a new client on. Um, diary management, for example, that was something that um, I put some systems and processes in place. One of the things that I do is anything that is paid work in my diary goes in in red and any, everything else is in blue. Um, and yellow is for, con is for connections that are neither blue, neither unpaid client work or paid client work. And so it means that I can look at my diary at, at a glance and see um, if I have um, you know, paid work that day that I need to, to focus on. So little things like that, processes that just make my life easier and quicker. Task management, again, I use Trello. Um, I use the, the tools. I also have 
systems, uh, a process, like I mentioned earlier, where I, you know, decide my three tasks that I want to do the next day, the most important things. Goal setting and planning, I use, I have my own planners that I use. I track my finances. I have a spreadsheet that has all of the formulas, you know, that update. I don't have to do it every time. It will calculate what my PayPal fee is and all of that stuff. Um, I have spreadsheets for all of that stuff. Uh, and then project management. I have my systems in place for that as well. Like I will... Um, again some spreadsheets that i use that i again i can share these with people if people want to reach out and ask me for them i i have a whole zip file that i can send of of templates that i use but and these are things that i created over time you know for sure when i first started my business back in 2014 i didn't have these things but i when i read turning pro and i really made this decision to kind of you know up level I put all of these things in place and, and they save me. They, they take time initially and that's why a lot of us put, put it off. It's like I don't have the time to put systems and processes in place, but actually um, they save time in the long run. And then strategies also for, time, for saving time or leveraging your time. So the one thing, um, there's a book called The One Thing, which I highly recommend if you haven't read it, but it's a thing that I carry through um, much of my business in terms of whenever I'm feeling overwhelmed I always come back to what's the one thing that I could do what's the next most important thing that I could do and I took that from the book the one thing um, it's a it's a really incredible book and then also the power of three which is the three things that I will do um, the next day that's really important and very effective for me planning is a strategy I use to save time and to not um, get lost in overwhelm um, Writing things down. Oh, I was thinking, what, what does that mean? Writing things down. So things like my goals, you know, the things that I want to achieve, making sure they're written out, my vision, all of that stuff, because there's power in having things written down. There's, there's actual studies that show that um, I think it's 40, we're 42% more likely. There's a study that was done um, and, it, and they, they found that they were 42% more likely to achieve their goals if they had written them down rather than um, as opposed to those that hadn't written their goals down. So I'm a big believer in having things written down in my journal or sharing them for accountability, all of that stuff. Time blocking or time chunking, some people call it something I do. I don't need to do it anymore because my baby does it for me. But when we have, you'll, you'll probably have experienced this, when we have um, endless time to do something like a whole day to write a blog post or a whole week to, you know, work on our newsletter, whatever it might be, then we'll take whatever time's available. So a really effective strategy for leveraging my time is to actually restrict the time I have available to do certain tasks. And for me, that can be, that can look like putting, setting 45 minutes on the clock. I usually do 45 minutes or 90 minutes, depending on how ADD I'm feeling. Um, and a shorter time if I'm feeling particularly flitty. Um, and, and then I, and I, I'm not allowed to do anything but that task in that time. And so that's a really useful thing. Like I say, when you have a baby and you're only working part-time, you don't need to do that because I constantly feel like the clock is, is ticking, the timer is running out. Repurposing content is another strategy. So for example, this topic of turning pro, I've done uh, a Facebook Live on it. I've done uh, the downloadable workbook. I've done a workshop on it. I did a free seven day challenge in it. I've done newsletters on it. Um, and so, and, and you might think, well, who wants to, who's going to want to um, engage with that same content? It's not the same. It's different in, in, all the variations but similar content in all of those ways and people do people do and different people will engage with different things some people will watch my facebook live that wouldn't have done the challenge and so when i go into a topic i repurpose that content in as many ways as i can and that's a great leverage of my time um, and then another strategy that i love which comes from gary vaynerchuk is document don't create and i've shared this a few times with people um, we get so het up in creating content that we don't realize that um, one of the easiest ways we can leverage our time is to just document our journey so when i when i discovered this if you if you want to if you google document don't create gary 
Gary V, you'll find the article in the video and it's quite, it's quite enlightening because um, it's thing, it's things like, for example, sharing um, my experience of a book that I've read or um, sharing an insight that I've suddenly had or sharing a struggle that I'm facing in my life um, or my business rather than sitting down and saying, how can I create, um, you know, like brand new content. So that's something that I, I, I've taken on board the document Don't Create and it's really helpful. Obviously he's written quite a detailed article so um, there's much more to it than that but I would take a look if you um, if you if you get a chance and so okay so that's that's it in terms of leveraging your time other than the three questions that are in your workbook so here um, it's get honest about the ways in which you waste the time that you have available to you and for sure we all love to say how busy we are and if we're really really honest with ourselves I mean even now I know there are times when I um, I waste time for sure. I'll, it takes nothing for me to pop out of my office to go and check on the baby, even though he's perfectly fine and safe and happy with my um, partner. But I, you know, I use it as an excuse. I just want to see how he is, but really I'm procrastinating and, and missing him a little bit. And then also write out all the things that currently suck your time and highlight those that are within your control. And do something about it so this thing of you know we say we don't have enough time and then we'll waste an hour on Facebook so look at those uh, time sucks that you can control and do something about it and then what solutions could you implement for these time sucks so have a think about using maybe the list that I've um, shared in terms of things like Calendly and Zoom and all of that stuff and think, you know, maybe you've been thinking for a while, I'll have a look at Calendly and see if it, if it could work. I resisted it for such a long time because it took a lot to set it up. It doesn't really, but I had in my head that it did. Um, and now I can't believe the difference between going back and forth for a week with somebody trying to get a time in the diary that works in both of our time zones versus sending someone a link and allowing them to book the session that works for them. So it's just, it's a no brainer. So have a think about what solutions, tools, strategies you could impl implement to help you with those time sucks. Any questions on, on this part? We've got one more little section and then we're going to be coming to an end. Gosh. I thought this was going to be my Donna saying automated scheduling is the best. Yeah, it is amazing. It's changed my life. I thought this was going to be my shortest workshop, and I think it's going to be my longest of the three. It's quite hilarious. I should just not even say I'm going to do it in an hour. So embrace the mystery. This is the final piece. So far, we've looked at the part of the turning pro journey that we have control over. You know, all of the getting organized, being more focused, um, making the decision, all of that stuff. Now it's time to turn our attention to the part that's beyond our control. Um, and this is the part that we might refer to as the mystery, the muse, inspiration, the magic, flow, the sublime, inspiration, all of that stuff. Um, and that's the part that we, we don't really control. And so um, the key distinction that he makes in the book here is that the professional trusts the mystery. The professional knows that the muse will always deliver. And I have a section of the book that I want to read. Is it? it might be in the next slide. One second. Oh, yeah, I like this. So the professional trust in the mystery. Patricia Ryan Madsen taught improv at Stanford for years to standing room only classes. Patricia has an exercise that, she's, that she calls what's in the box. She asks her students to imagine a small white box. Imagine a lid on this box. Now lift the lid. What do you find inside? Some students say a diamond, sometimes a frog, sometimes a pomegranate. The trick is there is always something inside the box. And remember, this is an imaginary box. With this exercise, Patricia was addressing her students' seminal terror that they would get up on stage and draw a blank. But the professional trusts the mystery. He knows that the muse always delivers. She may surprise us. She may give us something we never expected, but she will always put something inside the box. I love that. I love that quote. And then 
Something else that Stephen says, another quote from the book is, um, we're all nothing without the muse, but the pro has learned that the goddess prizes labor and dedication beyond any theatrical seeking of her favors. The professional does not wait for inspiration. He acts, he, he acts in anticipation of it. He knows that when the muse sees his butt in the chair, she will deliver. And I love that. This is the combination of all the things that are in our control in terms of turning up as a professional and, and getting our place, getting our environment sacred, making sure we have the right equipment, getting our processes and our systems in place, and then knowing that, you know, the muse will deliver and that we'll know what to write, we'll know what to say on our coaching sessions, we'll know what to say when we do our Facebook Live, whatever it might be. Um, we trust as professionals that the muse will deliver. And I love that. I love that idea. Any, any questions on that or any of the sections so far? That's it in terms of um, the content for the workshop. Um, I'm going to spend two minutes just really quickly talking about um, the Female Business Academy. So like I said at the beginning um, of, the, of the workshop, uh, one of the reasons that I'm doing this workshop is to give people an, an experience of the kind of topics that we cover in, in the Female Business Academy. What it is, is an online school which offers in one place business classes, advice, tools and strategies, community, inspiration, and a lot more for a very affordable subscription fee. And the word that I would pull out, because um, before I used to always focus on, you know, the the things that you could get in the academy, the, the, the classes, the tools, the PDFs, the downloads, all of that stuff, which is there. But the big bit that makes the academy magical for me is the community. We have some incredible heart-centered female entrepreneurs in the academy that are doing incredible things in the world that have really bold and exciting visions. And um, one of the, one of the um, women said, um, when we were discussing what she loves about the academy, she said, you know, whenever you put something in the group, because we have a, a private Facebook group, it's never crickets. And it's true. We put something into the academy. I ask, ask a question, I'll put a prompt and there's so much interaction. It's crazy. And it's really, there's a real strong sisterhood in the academy that is wonderful. Um, and then just to share with you my mission for the academy. So it's uh, the mission of the Female Business Academy is to educate, empower, and inspire female entrepreneurs to rise up and kick some business ass and in turn inspire other women to do the same. Um, female empowerment is a massive, massive thing for me. It's my, um, it's my calling in life. It's what I'm turning pro to do. And then finally, just one thing I want to say, the... This is my gift for people who have registered for the workshop. Um, the early bird pricing, we, we close enrollment tomorrow. I can't believe it's the last day. Um, we close for the year and we don't open um, enrollment again until 2018. Um, the early bird price that I was offering, which is just 20 euros um, a month, ended last Friday. So, so it, it, you're not able to get the early bird price on the website right now. It's just the standard price, which is 25 euro a month. Um, but for anybody who's registered for the um, workshops, any of the workshops, they can get this special price, the early bird price up until midnight tomorrow. So I'm just going to put the link for that. Let's see if I can do that. Um, I think what I need to do is stop share. Okay, there we go. And I can see myself again. For the entire workshop, I couldn't see me. So um, there, in the, there in the chat is a link and that, that will guarantee you the early bird price up until uh, midnight tomorrow. Friday the 27th so that's just my gift for you so to stay until the end of this very long workshop and then the only thing left um, is I'll just go back to the screen and share I don't know why when I'm in when I'm in screen share it doesn't allow me it doesn't allow me to to put things in the chat is um my contact details. I just want to leave those there for you. So um, my website is carolineland.com. 
the Female Business Academy is on femalebusinessacademy.net, although you'll need that special link if you want to enroll at the, at the early bird price. And if you have any questions at all, um, anything that I've mentioned in the workshop that you want to know more about, anything to do with the Female Business Academy, um, simply drop me an email at caroline at carolineround.com. And I think, I'm going to stop the share again. Um, that's it. That's all I have to say. Thank you so much for staying on. Um, we have run over a bit more than I expected to. Um, let's see. I can see messages popping in the chat. Charlotte says, thank you, Caroline. A lot to take in, yeah. That, the other thing as well, I'll send out a replay tomorrow um, if anybody wants to refer back to it. Um, and, and for any of you that are in the Academy or who join us in the Academy, the, the replays will be there um, forever and um, also all of the slides as well for all of the, the three workshops. So um, Cindy says, thank you, Caroline, lovely to meet all you ladies. Thank you, Cindy, for joining us. Thank you, Meryl, thank you. Um, have lovely evenings or days wherever you are and hopefully you'll join us in the Academy. But if not, we have a, I have a public free group on Facebook called the Female Business Collective so you can um, seek us out there and, and stay in touch that way. All right, my lovelies, take, take good care. Bye.